and action. All right, we are here live, and uh, if you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 5. If you're live streaming with us, if you will, if you'll turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 5. We've been going through the book of Acts, and as I announced, as advertised, it's going to be a long study. I hope you're enjoying it, but it is a long study. It's 28 chapters, and there's a whole lot to it, so it's probably going to take us about a year uh, to get through it. I hope you don't get tired of it, though, but there is something new every week, and so if you kind of look at it like that, uh, chronologically, it's one of the most exciting books. It's a book of action. It's a book, especially when we get into the Apostle Paul's uh, ministry, it's just an exciting thing. But in the book of Acts, we have seen how that God is establishing his church and God is establishing his leaders to spread his gospel. Throughout Scripture, several times you're going to find that God begins doing new things to establish new eras. That's one of the, uh, the exciting things about studying the Bible, you know, from start to finish, as you can see as you work through Scripture how that God is doing different things in different eras to accomplish different purposes. Now, here's the thing. His truth does not change. His gospel does not change. His eternal agenda does not change. But sometimes, and I know at a Baptist church, this is like saying a cuss word, methodologies, methodologies do change. Methodologies will change. Have you ever been in a Baptist church and seen the preacher get up and make a little bit of a change and, and everybody don't even know what to do? Now, I tell you, y'all did that to me one time. One time I came in on pastor appreciation or something, and everybody had changed seats, and then I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who was there and who wasn't there, and I looked over here, and I saw Kirk Cleary, and Kirk's always sitting over here, and then Perry was sitting over here, and he always sits over here, and I, 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 was, I was starting to preach and give my introduction. Finally, I just stopped and said, what is going on, you know? What happened? I mean, I thought I was in the twilight zone. Uh, so, you know, methodologies, metho we, we don't like change. But, uh, you know, but, but fortunately for us, you know, God is a God of change. As you study Scripture, you're going to discover there are several. Here's what we call them, okay? I, I'm, I'm what you would call a dispensationalist in terms of how I interpret Scripture. My hermeneutic is somewhat a, a dispensational in its orientation. And what I mean by that is this. I do believe that God... Throughout Scripture, I believe through, dispens th through, through different dispensations and through different stewardships, I believe that God instructs man to respond to him in a new and a different way. Now, again, let's be, let's, let's be clear. Throughout Scripture, every person that's ever been saved has been saved by grace, through faith. Every, every person, every person. However, you also realize that as you're reading through Scripture, the people in the Old Testament, they didn't know what we know now. We're looking back on things that they were looking forward to, and they didn't have any idea, it, like the cross, the crucifixion, the blood atonement. There was, there's so many things, you know, they understood blood atonement in terms of, you know, sacrificing uh, lambs, and they understood, you know, to some degree that, but they didn't understand everything that was going on. And so, you know, I'm going to give you these, these dispensations. Our title tonight's Many Signs and Wonders, and we'll look at that. But, uh, you know, as you, as you fill out your, um, uh, your paper there, uh, just remember, you know, we begin with Adam and Eve, and that's the dispensation of innocence from creation to fall. And then, you know, you move to conscience. God gave us, we have a conscience, and that, that kind of uh, was prevalent from the fall all the way to the flood. Then you had human government, and that's from the flood to the Tower of Babel. Then you have the patriarch, the time of a patriarch and a promise, and that was from Abraham to Exodus. And then the law, you had Sinai, Mount Sinai, where God gave the law to Moses, all the way uh, to Calvary, where Christ died. Then you have the dispensation of grace. It's the descent of the Holy Spirit. We see that in, in the book of Acts, all the way to the descent of Christ at his second coming. And then after the second coming, there's the last dispensation of millennium. That's the descent of Christ at the, at the second coming, all the way to the great white throne. Now, you know, I'm not, not going to take time tonight to explain uh, the differences in every dispensation, but suffice it to say that with every dispensation, the reason we call it a different dispensation is because God gives different instructions, different judgments. There's different things that are going on during that particular um, uh, dispensation. And so just for that, you know, whenever you hear somebody say, well, you know, are, are there seven dispensations? I can't tell you there's seven or that there's eight. I can't tell you. And some people believe there's four. Uh, there's all, they're, they're all over the board. But this is the one that, you know, uh, uh, John, where's John? John was showing me his Ryrie Bible. If you know anything about Charles Ryrie, Charles Ryrie, he, he died adamant. There's seven dispensations just like that. And if you get his Bible, he's going to be, he's going to be looking through the Bible through this lens here. Now I'm just giving giving you that so that you can kind of see that just from our standpoint, as we look through Scripture, we can derive that these seven dispensations really do kind of jump out as God's saying, okay, I'm doing a new thing here. 
and I'm doing it in a new way, and I'm giving you uh, new instruction on that. And so just keep that in mind as we work through this. But through all of these dispensations, God's eternal purpose is the same. That's the main thing we need to know. The dispensations may be the same. His methodologies may be the same. His instruction may be the same. His expectation may be, the, may, or, or may be different. But here's the thing. Uh, God, God's purpose does not change. And all of this, as you see this, you see, okay, there's different things that are going on in innocence and, go and conscience and government, different things. There may not be the same. However, here's what is the same. God's, met God's methodology has changed, but God's eternal purpose does not change. And it might surprise you to know because a lot of people would say, well, God's eternal purpose, the main purpose is the redemption of man. That is not the main purpose of the Bible. That's, it, it is a main, a main purpose, but it is not the main purpose of the Bible. The main purpose of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the glory of God. It's the glory of God. Now, is redemption part of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the main purpose is not the redemption of man. The main purpose is the glory of God. It just so happens that God gets a lot of glory out of man being redeemed. Somebody say amen. You know, now God has, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of different things here. God has two people groups in, in Scripture. And it's important, I think, that we understand this. Number one, there's a pe the people group of Israel. And I still believe that God is not done. I don't believe God's done with Israel. I believe that during the tribulation, God will deal with Israel just as he promised that he would. And then there's also the church, though. And we have the church age. What is the church age? Well, the church age is from the very time that the Holy Spirit descended in Acts chapter 2, as we've been reading, all the, all the way until the second coming of Jesus. That's the church age. Then you have the two gospels. What is, you say, well, Pastor John, I thought there was just one gospel. Well, as you read through Scripture, there's two gospels. One gospel is specific to Israel, and that's the gospel of the kingdom. Do you remember when Jesus came preaching? He, was he preaching death, burial, and resurrection? No. Was John the Baptist preaching death, burial, and resurrection? No. John the Baptist didn't know anything about it. Even when the disciples during Jesus' ministry, were they preaching death, burial, and resurrection? Absolutely not. What were they preaching? They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus Christ was coming, uh, had come, that he would be king. And king over who? King over Israel. You know, now he's obviously going to be all of our king during the millennial reign of Christ, but that was the gospel of the kingdom. But then what happens? As soon as he dies, he's buried, he raises again, what gospel were, were, was being preached? The death, burial, and resurrection. Then you got two purposes, national redemption. For who? For Israel. And then spiritual redemption. For who? For anybody who would call on the name of the Lord whether bond or free, Jew or Gentile, didn't male or female, it did not matter. And so as you look at that, just realize as, you're, as you're, you're, you're reading Scripture and as you're interpreting it, there are two groups that God is working through. He works through Israel. He works through the church. And there's two Gospels, Gospel of the Kingdom. Jesus is going to be king, and he's going to reign on the uh, throne of David. He's, going to, uh, he's out of the tribe of Judah. And then there's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that's the gospel that we are preaching today. That's the gospel of salvation and redemption. Then there's two purposes. God is going to redeem Israel, his people. Here's the difference. Israel is the wife of God. The church is the bride of Christ. That's the difference. Israel is the wife of God throughout the Old Testament. You see that even especially in the book of Hosea. But Israel is the wife of God, but the, but the church is the, um, the bride of Christ. And so I don't want to confuse you and all that. I just kind of want to give you an idea as to when you're, when you're working through Scripture, you have to realize, you know, that God's methodologies throughout, they change, but God's purpose, it does not change. We can learn a valuable lesson from God's example, though. You know, here's what happens in, in most churches. You'll agree with me, I think, when I tell you this. What do we worship most of the time? Now, I'm not talking about Peace Saving Baptist Church necessarily, but I'm talking about, you know what a lot of churches worship? They worship memories. This is how our church used to be. They worship memberships. You know, these are the people that used to be here. And then they worship their methodologies. This is how we always done it. And here's the problem. If you are worshiping your, the memory of something that happened 20 years ago, or you're worshiping what somebody did that's, uh, that's laying in the cemetery over here, and I don't say that disrespectfully. I'm just saying, you know, that, uh, oh, well, this is how brother so-and-so did it, or somebody's left, uh, you know, and they're not here anymore. You worship methodologies. Here's what happened. That church is bound to die at some point, bound to die. I mean, you know, and, and, and the thing is, here's why. It's because we don't realize that cultures change and things change, and sometimes you have to make different, you have to make choices, and you have to make some uh, changes in your church so that it can actually be, 
you know, effective in the culture that we live in now. But, you know, there's a lot of churches that are dying because they say, we ain't never done it that way, and we're not going to do it that way, and we're not going to change. And you've heard preachers say it. I don't want to, I don't want to beat that dead horse, but here, here's, here, here's what we need to understand. Truth does not change. Traditions do. Truth does not change. It never changes. Traditions do change. So the real question is this. Does what, does what, what, what we are doing as a church, does it contradict Scripture? If it doesn't contradict Scripture, then we shouldn't be so awful, much, uh, so awful against it. And if it doesn't, you know, it, you know, here's the thing. Does it fit within the personality of our church culture? Does it fit within the personality, uh, you know, of our community? Uh, changing, changing God's Word is always wrong. Can we all agree on that? If you agree on that, say amen. Changing God's Word is always wrong. But what about changing our method? What if we change how you do things? Now, most of the time when preachers get up and preach this, you know what they're doing? They're getting you ready. They're, and most every sinner saying, okay, what's coming? You know, what's happening? Nothing. I have nothing in mind. You know, as far as changes go, I, you know, we've changed as much as, as I feel like right now that we need to change in any way, shape, or form. But, I, you know, I, I'm just saying it just because it's going to tie into what we're talking about today. Changing God's Word, changing truth, we don't do it because it stays the same. But changing methodology at times, it's healthy and it's productive. And we've even seen, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the product of that. We've seen uh, the results of that and the benefits of that. Now, with all that in mind, I want you to notice first of all, first point number one, I used to listen to a guy, and this is how he would preach his sermons. He said, now it's time for my very first, he said, that was my introduction, now it's time for my first big point, you know. So now it's time for my first big point. That was Harold Clayton. Anybody, does anybody ever listen to Harold Clayton? Anybody? Okay, nobody even knows who I'm talking about. He's the one that said eons and eons ago, you know, back when nobody had any fun. He would always talk about that. All right, you don't know who I'm talking about, so it doesn't mean anything to you. All right, miraculous. Here we go. A miraculous authentication. Let's look at verses 12 through 13. Remember the title of our message today is Signs and Wonders. So let's look at verses 12 and 13. Our Bible says this. Now remember, this is right on the heels of what's, what's happened. Barnabas has sold his property and, 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 and for whatever, to whatever degree he was honored for it by the church. And then what happens? Well, what happens after that? Ananias and Sapphira, you remember what they do? They kind of want that pat on the back too. They sell their property, but they lie to the Holy Ghost. They lie to God, and they drop dead right there in the church, and they're carried out. All right, so this is where we're at now. Now the Bible says in verse 12, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Verse 13, Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. Skip down to verse 16. Also a, mul also a multitude gathered from sur the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And the Bible says that they were all healed. You know, the last time, again, that we looked at Acts, we saw both Ananias and Sapphira, and they were carried out because, as Peter put it in verse 4, he says, you've lied not just to men. You've lied to God. You have lied to the Holy Ghost. Now, today we live in a society that does not take sin seriously. Would you agree with that? We live in a society, you say, why, why are we not taking sin seriously? Well, here's why. We don't take God seriously, and we don't take Scripture seriously. When we start taking God seriously and we start taking His Word seriously, we will take sin seriously. But right now, we are not living in a, in a culture that takes sin very seriously. And what has been dubbed as a postmodern culture, what we have done is we've minimized the significance of sin. And here's what's even, here's what's even more sobering. We've humanized God. We've made God like us or made ourselves like God, every which way you want to look at it. But because we take such a, view, a, a low view of God, we can't believe it when he aggressively addresses unconfessed sin. And we ask ourselves this question. We say, how in the world could God do such a thing? Because we're listen, here's what we're talking about. Ananias and Sapphira, they had dropped dead. I mean, they've been carried out and buried, our Bible tells us. So you ask, ask ourselves the question, how could God even do this? Now, I, for one, today I'm glad that God doesn't still deal with us like he did in the first century. <laughs> I already got a hand up, you know. How many of you would agree with Aaron on that, you know? How many are glad that God does not do that, you know? Vance Havner said this. He said, if God dealt with people as he did in the day of Ananias and Sapphira, every church would need a morgue in the basement. And Vance Havner was right. Is that right? I mean, you just need an undertaker here every week. 
you know, and you probably have to replace your pastor every week. I mean, that's kind of how it would be. Uh, just one of the, uh, so, so be glad, you know, that I was talking about methodologies. Be glad that methodology has changed some, to some degree. But in reference to Ananias and Sapphira and their hunger for glory, our Bible tells us they were killed due to their dishonesty. Now, now let's all just be honest today. Everybody here has at some time been just as guilty. Let's just be honest. We have ourselves at some point in our lives, we have been just as guilty as Ananias and Sapphira. And then we ask ourselves the question, well, why am I still alive? Well, as you study the new eras of God, you will find two common denominators at their own set. And here's what they are. Number one, new judgments. And number two, new miracles. Every time that God, every time that God introduces a new era, there will be new judgments, as I said before, and new miracles. For whatever reason, this is how God was dealing with the inception of the church at that point in time, and I believe he was doing it for this reason. This is a John Bowman conjecture. This is my speculation. But I believe what God was doing was God was making it very clear that he was serious about sin. He was serious about his bride. He was serious about the church, and he didn't want people messing around with it. And all those people who saw Ananias and Sapphira die that day and knew why they had died, I believe it put a fear in their heart and understanding that God is not messing around. God's not playing around. He is very serious about his church. But we see, uh, you know, during uh, uh, common denominators at the onset of new eras, and then again, special judgments, special miracles. For example, at the beginning of the age of the law, do you remember what God did? God sent 10 plagues to Egypt, including the death angel. What else did he do to establish himself and his authority? He actually parted the Red Sea, and then he closed it back in on the Egyptians. Don't forget how that God, you remember a few weeks ago when we were talking about Korah from the book of Jude? Remember what happened with Korah? Korah decided that he was, that he was going to make himself equal to Moses, even though God had established Moses as a leader. And what in the world did God do? God swallowed him up and everybody that was following him. So God was doing, again, new miracles, new judgments. And you say, what about new miracles? Well, the new miracles were the, what was Moses able to do? He's able to, they were able to throw the rod down and become a snake. They were able to, he was able to make his hand leprous. And then the, the ten plagues, the death angel, and then the parting of the Red Sea. And so the people are seeing God's authority right there. But along with God's authority being raised to a new height, at least in what is visible, there was also judgments that had been raised up as well. The expectation had been raised up as well. You know, the last time again that we looked at Acts, we saw that going on with Ananias and Sapphira at the very onset of this church age. Think about this. At the age of conquest, we see special judgment in Achan's case. But we also see what? We see special miracles. What's the miracle? Well, as Joshua is marching around the city, walking, marches around the city for seven days, six days, he goes around once, seventh day, seven times. And what happens? Well, we see the walls and they crash in. But then what do you also see? That's a new miracle, but you also see what? You see a new judgment because when Achan took of the forbidden spoils of war, he and his family were executed. So, you know, we see the miracle in the walls of Jericho, but we also see a judgment uh, with Achan's situation. How about the prophets? There's an age of the prophets. And again, this is not dispensational as much as it is just an era, but the era of the prophets was a, there was a special judgment on the prophets of Baal as they were slain under Elijah and all those young people, you remember, who mocked Elisha. And the Bible says that they were slain as well by she-bears. But we also seen special miracles. And I'm, all, I'm giving you this just so we'll all understand that when God brings in a new era, there's going to be new judgments, there's going to be new miracles. In the tribulation era, by the way, Who's going to be the two witnesses? I believe it's going to be Moses and Elijah. I mean, I, and you say, Pastor John, why do you, how, what do you base that on? Just based on the, the, the specific miracles that the Bible gives us that they're working. They're very similar, if, if not identical, to the miracles of Moses and to the miracles of Elijah. And so I'm going to assume that it's going to be Moses and Elijah. But you know during the tribulation era, there will be miracles that are unprecedented that these two prophets are going to work. For three and a half years, these prophets, Moses and Elijah, they're going to be preaching the gospel and they're going to be performing miracles to where God authenticates them and validates them as his leader. But not only will there be new miracles, ladies and gentlemen, there will be new what? Judgments. 
I mean, you talk about the judgments of the, of the seals and the trumpets and the vials. You put all that stuff together, and you realize God is doing something much different during that time. Now, what about the era in which we now live in? Because that's the one we really want to talk about. The era that we now live in, how did it start? You know, this is the age of grace. This is the church age. Again, we just talked about how the Ananias and Sapphira suffered special judgment at the onset of this era, but there are also special miracles. Now, let's, let's talk about something for a minute. From time to time, we'll have people that'll come and they'll say, we want to join your church. And, and I always have a meeting with them, and I always go over, you know, certain aspects and certain things, certain categories of our church. One of the things that I do cover very carefully are the sign gifts. Now, here's why. There are people that come to our church that say that they want to pray in a prayer language. And I tell them, you know, that's not, you know, it's not something that I encourage it's not even something that I've ever done. It's not something that, I'd even, that I'm even sure can be done. But I do tell them, you know, I tell them this. I explain to them where that comes from, when that was happening, and when it was prevalent. It was pre the prayer language is, is, is something totally different, but as far as just speaking in tongues and as far as men having the ability to heal, I do not believe in faith healers. I do, and here's why. I believe that God is the healer. He always has been the healer. But if you go back and you look at the eras, the special eras of the Bible, here's what they are. Number one, Moses and Elijah. Number two, Elijah and Elisha. Number three, Jesus and the apostles. And number four, the two witnesses. In, all, in every case, Moses and Elijah, what is God wanting to do? He's wanting to establish them for that era and to show his power through them. He would let them or empower them to work miracles. Now you get to the era of the prophets. What does Elijah and Elisha do? They work miracles. Jesus and the apostles, what are they doing? They're working miracles. And the two witnesses, what will they do? They will work miracles. But you will notice as Moses and Aaron, as they're working miracles, and then the miracles subside for hundreds of years. And then Elijah and Elisha come on the scene, and then God once again empowers these two men to be able to work miracles. And then the miracles subside. And then Jesus and the apostles come on the scene. Jesus being God himself, he works miracles to establish himself as the Son of God. And the apostles are working miracles to establish them as his servants. And then miracles subside. We are, we, we, we are in the part the era where the miracles have completely subsided. There's no point in speaking in tongues at this point. There's none. There's no point in it. There was a point then because the Word of God had not been written. Well, now the Word of God's been written, and it's in thousands of languages, and people can read the Bible, and they can understand it in their, in their language. And there's two things about tongues. Number one, they're not necessary. And number two, they're so, they were so abused that they had to come off the scene. Because everybody was saying, oh, you know, well, if I'm not speaking in a tongue, then I'm not filled with the Holy Ghost. And then people wanted to speak in tongues for the same reason that Ananias and Sapphira wanted the pat on the back for selling their stuff and bringing the money and saying they brought it all. Paul dealt with this in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. The carnal church at Corinth, remember what Paul said? He said, I wish that all of you did speak in tongues. And you remember 1 Corinthians 12, he even talked about how that not everyone was going to have that gift. Nowadays, here's what happens. You go to certain churches and certain denominations, and as soon as you walk in the door, they want to put you through a class to teach you how to speak in tongues so you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't even know what to say to that. Number one, why do you have to take a class to learn how to do it, right? And, and, and then on top of that, Here's the thing that, 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 that bothers me is that they're assuming that every person that is filled with the Holy Ghost will speak in a tongue. And Paul says clearly that not everybody was going to have that gift, just a few people, and that was during the first century. And so, you know, as we look at this, this I, I want to clarify that during the first century, people were speaking in tongues, and it was beneficial. Uh, people were being healed. Peter in uh, uh, Acts chapter 9 raises Tabitha, Dorcas, from the dead. Acts chapter 6, six we look at verse 8. We see these deacon prototypes of Stephen. We see them, them work, they're working signs. So there's special miracles for the introduction of a special time. But here's the, here's the big question. What was the purpose in the miracles? What was the purpose in the miracles? And I've already kind of given you a spoiler alert. I've already told you. The purpose of the miracles was to authenticate the leadership so that people would look to, to, to God's leaders and know who was and who wasn't. 
That was the point at that particular time. God authenticated Moses as his leader to be followed. God authenticated Joshua. He authenticated Elijah on Mount Carmel. He authenticated Elisha. He's authenticated all of his leaders, and he did that at the beginning of these eras. And all of that, God was saying, these are my leaders, follow them. These are my leaders, follow them. By the way, in your church, and, and, and I'm, I may be shooting myself in the foot a little bit here, but I, I think it's worth saying, and I think it's true. In your church, if your pastor has not been used to do something special, then you probably want to find another pastor. If God has not worked through him, if you have not seen God work through your pastor in some special way, now I'm not saying a miraculous way in terms of raising somebody from the dead or healing blinded eyes, but if God, if you have not seen God work through your pastor in some special way, in his preaching, in his teaching, in his witnessing, in his life, and whatever, then there's something wrong there. Because I still believe that God authenticates his leadership. He does it in some way, shape, or form. There's a reason for that man to be followed, and it needs to be obvious. And I don't know what the obvious thing would be for John Bowman. I don't know what that is. I just know this. I just know that God, when he establishes a leader, he puts his hand on that man. He puts his hand on that person. He anoints them in a special way. And it may, it may not be the same way as another person, but he's going to have some special anointing to where you can say, this is how I know God's hand is on that man. And if that's not true, then you need to find somebody else. Because God has a special appointment and he has a special anointing on his people. Now, this is not to say, you know, that miracles only serve for the purpose of authenticating the apostles. You know, for Jesus' ministry, and give you three things here that I, that I have found in my own study in terms of Jesus' ministry. And, of course, I'm always skip to that next one. Yeah, this is the one I want you to see. This is a threefold purpose for Jesus' miracles. Number one, obviously credentials. That's what we've talked about. It establishes Jesus' credentials as the Son of God and as God himself. But number two, not just that, it's also that he would meet human needs. Jesus used miracles to have compassion on people. He would meet their needs. And we saw that so many times, you know, in our study in the book of Luke. And then to convey truth, to convey truth. So there's a communication. There's a con credentials, number one, that's Jesus, you know, we know that he's the son of God because of the miracles that he was able to work. That's what Nicodemus said. We know you have to be from God. Nicodemus didn't understand yet. It wasn't from God. He was God. He was God. But number two, he used miracles to have compassion on people. He wanted people, you know, to have their human needs met. But then ultimately, what, what was the whole purpose? The whole purpose was to communicate the gospel to communicate truth. And so all of it, you know, it encompasses it all. You remember when Jesus fed the 5,000, what did he do? Well, number one, he, he met, their, uh, uh, met their human need because he fed them, you know. Number two, it was a miraculous feeding, and so he established his credibility. And number three, he preached on himself as the bread of life. And so you see that working there, his credentials. Number one, what was it? Well, it was a miraculous feeding. So Jesus' credentials, during that, during that miracle, they were met. Number two, compassion. He met their human need. Number three, communication. He was able to preach the gospel, to preach a sermon. So the apostles did the exact same thing. They, were, they, they presented their credentials by doing it. They meet the need, and then they're able to preach a sermon. You know, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, our Bible says this. Our Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 that uh, the prophets laid the foundation of the church as pastors and teachers and evangelists, you know, and building on that. And so as we see that, you know, uh, we understand that these apostles, they are themselves being used by God during this era to lay the foundation of the church. Now, who is the, who is the foundation of the church? Jesus. Jesus, exactly, Jesus. So that's number one, number one, the miracles. It's an, it's an authentication, a miraculous authentication, and that's what we're seeing here in Acts chapter 5. I want to read these verses again. The Bible says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. In verse 16, Also a great multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick, pe sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, the reason I'm spending a, a little bit of time on that is for this reason. As we work through the book of Acts, these miracles are going to establish these men as God's leaders 
and this is how this the church is built. And again, when we go back and we see Ephesians 2.20, our Bible says, there it is, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. There's our answer. But the apostles themselves, they're being used. The prophets were used as well in the Old Testament, paving the way. But the apostles, what are they doing? They are being used by God to establish the authenticity of the leadership and, of course, being used to move forward through the church. Let's look at this, though. Here's an interesting verse in verse 15, a misguided absurdity. You know, read this and tell me what you think about this, verse 15. So all these miracles, keep in mind what's happened. The miracles are being worked by the apostles. Then you get to verse 13 and watch what the people do. So they brought the sick out of the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. <laughs> you know, when you read that, you, you sense the superstition that's going on here. Here's what, here's what happens. They hear about, and by the way, we have it now. We have it now in certain churches, certain denominations. You know, you have this kind of thing where uh, how, many of you, how many of you have received your bag of mustard seeds in, in, in the mail yet? Anybody? Have you, have you ordered? How about your, your vial of holy water? Have you gotten your vial of holy water uh, in the mail or may, maybe your box of prayer cloths? I was watching the other night, and I'm going to call the guy's name. I don't mind calling the guy's name, and I don't care if he calls me. but Because even his name kind of gets, Peter Popoff, have you, have you seen this guy? You know, it's late night television, and, and, and again, I'm calling him out. And, and I'm calling him out for this reason, not, not to be mean-spirited or anything. But, but this guy advertises that he can send you a vial of water that that's, has healing power. Somebody help me. He's going to send you a vial of water, and it's got healing power. Uh, thank you. Thank you. But it's just as false as this because, these, you know, what these people started thinking? They started thinking, man, if Peter's shadow just goes across, what are they doing? Well, they're making it about Peter, number one. And number two, they've gotten superstitious because now they're believing that if Peter's shadow just goes across somebody that's sick, that they're going to be healed. Ladies and gentlemen, the power of the apostles had been demonstrated. It had been manifested so strongly that people started embracing this, this superstitious absurdity. Oh, if Peter's shadow just fell upon them, they would be healed. And we know that's not true. That's not true. But that's how, that's how powerful. I mean, it says a lot about the power that Peter had, but it just goes to this point. And the point is that, you know, what, what we do sometimes and what churches have done and what leaders have done, like this gentleman that I have just mentioned, what he has done is he has taken something from the Word of God and he's run with it to a place that God never intended for it to go. God help these people that are waiting on their prayer cloth. By the way, it does require a donation. Always. Always. <laughs> and your mustard seeds. And your vial, of, your vial of water, your prayer cloth, your mustard seeds. We're going to send it to you. And you know what happens? This is so sad. What happens is these people are sitting and waiting by the mailbox so that they can receive this thing, this item, this entity and then they assume that it's going to have power in their life. And it has no power. God has the power, and he doesn't do it through a vial of water, through a mustard seed, or through a, through a prayer cloth. That's right. He does it through his spirit that lives within you. Can you imagine in the, first, in the first century if Peter was going around saying, I have prayer cloths for sale, you know, and I have mustard seeds for sale. You don't see anything like that that's authentic. You see that? Th those are the things that, uh, you know, the false prophets were doing. And by the way, what did we talk about a few weeks ago from Jude? Going after Balaam, using God to fulfill your greed. And there's so many guys out there that are doing that. They're selling God. You don't sell God. God's free. God's for everybody. You don't sell. God, you know, this is funny. The other day, you know, my wife was talking to somebody, and they were talking about wanting to come to the church. And the first question they asked, I'm telling you, this, this happened. The first question they asked was, now, do we still have to show our W-2s at the door when we come to join? And I'm like, where did this happen? How did this, how did, where did this start? I mean, haven't we gotten past this, you know, and it was, it's never been true. 
But for somebody somewhere took something that was said and said, you know, probably Pastor Bruce got up and preached a hard ser sermon on tithing and just told people, if you're going to be a good church member, you need to be a tithing church member. And you know what? I echo that. And then somebody says, well, I guess we got to show our W-2s at the door. And then somebody took that and said, oh, okay, well, now we have to show our W-2s at the door. And before you know it, it's 2022, and there's still a poor lady out there that thinks she's got to show her W-2 at the door and buy her way into the church. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, but some of you do. You've heard this. If you've been out soul winning, you've heard this, you know. And the thing is, it's never been true. Any more true than 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 the gym down there is a is a hanger for my air for my private jet, you know. I mean, that's just you know you hear that stuff as well, and that that's it's absurd. The only power that you need is in the pages of the written word of God, and the living word, which is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit of God that lives within you. There is no special power in seeds. There's no special power in a vial of water. There's no special power in a prayer cloth. And there's sure not a special power in the shadow of Peter. Peter had power to do what he did because God gave it to him, but it wasn't a superstitious thing. That's a mystical absurdity. And so lastly, let's look at the massive addition because this is the most important thing that happens in the book of Acts and in our time right now. Our Bible says in verse 14, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, are added, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. That's the massive addition. Essentially, this is the most important aspect of these few verses. Scores of people being saved, scores of people being baptized in the church. I'll tell you what I'm excited about. Most exciting thing that's going to happen in my life this week is Asa getting baptized. That's the most exciting thing that's going to happen. I mean, this week, unless somebody else gets saved, you know, but Asa getting saved, Asa getting baptized, I'm just telling you, that's going to be the most exciting thing that happens this week at Peace Saving Baptist Church. Are you excited about that? I'm excited about that. That's 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 the best thing that can happen. I don't care. Listen, some of our some of our people have come to me and said, you know, Pastor John, uh, we're gonna buy one lottery ticket, and if we win, we're gonna build us a brand new church. You know what? You can win the lottery. It ain't gonna be more exciting than Ace getting saved to me. It really it really isn't. It really isn't. And I hope and pray that God don't let us win the lottery. I don't want to win the lottery because I don't want the lottery to pay the bills. I want God to pay the bills. You say, well, God can pay the bills through the lottery. And if you win, you better give 10%. I am coming after your W-2. But other than that, uh, <laughs> we are checking yours at the door. But, you know, the, the long and the short of it is this. A billion dollars isn't more exciting than a soul being saved. And that's what, that's what this whole point is. And I know, I, know I've, I know we've been in the weeds a little bit tonight theologically, and I know that a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, I'm just giving it to you. Don't expect you to remember it necessarily. It's something you have to study for years to even grasp, and I'm not even sure that I have a full grasp of it. But one thing that I do know is this. I know that God has changed his methodology, but he has not changed his truth. God has changed his methodology, but he has not changed his truth, and he does not change. How he works during certain eras has changed, and we've watched it change, and it's clear that he changes. It's clear that he gives a different command here. It's clear that there are different judgments here. It's clear that there are different miracles here. It's clear that God has different expectations, but all in all, this is the truth. It is all about the glory of God. Is it, all, it is all about uh, God receiving glory through man's redemption. It's all about establishing God's leadership during those eras so that people would listen to them. And they are all not pointing themselves. Peter's not saying, look at my shadow. Peter's saying, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. And when it's all said and done, verse 14 says it all. Verse 14 says this. You know, you say, oh, look at these great miracles that are taking place. You see, from a human standpoint, most of the people are going to be looking and saying, oh, this person was healed of their sickness, and this person was healed of, their, of being demonized, and this person was healed of being crippled, and the blind have, are seeing, and the lame are leaping, and all of that stuff. And, you know, people, man, that's just great. And by the way, it is. It's great because only God can do that. But that's not the most exciting thing that happens. The most exciting thing that happens is verse 14. Verse 14 People are getting saved. People are getting baptized. People are, are coming into the family of God. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what we need to be excited about. I'll tell you this, man. You know, our, our, our perspectives and our hearts are skewed to some degree because, you know, we probably, if we heard somebody won the lottery, we'd probably get a little more excited about that than somebody getting saved. There's something wrong. Because all that money is going to pass away. 
that soul is forever. And that's what, we, that's what we need to be concerned about. Listen, if you're looking for a great miracle, the greatest miracle of all is sitting right here in these seats. Born-again believers who have been rescued from the darkness, born-again believers who have been rescued from their sin, from the very cesspool of iniquity, I'm telling you, that meets the greatest link uh, or, or need. It goes the greatest length, and it costs the greatest price. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, Jesus is the greatest price, greatest price. That's why Paul said, you know, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I believe. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's a power of God to salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That is what is most exciting about being a believer. And all God's people enthusiastically said, Amen. Lord, thank you so much tonight. Lord, there's a lot we don't understand. God, as we begin in Genesis and we, as we work through Scripture, Lord, we do see what appears to be different dispensations and different eras and different times and you working in different ways through different people and different miracles and different judgments and different expectations and yet lord through it all there's a common theme and that is the glory of god lord in all of it it all points to the glory of god it all goes to the cross lord i believe you received your greatest glory when your son hung on a cross sacrificed his life became sin that we might become the righteousness of you and so god we would just want to give glory to you tonight god we don't want to get caught up in superstitions we don't want to be enamored by uh, lord the physical over the spiritual god we, we want to see things through your lens and so lord tonight as a church i pray god that as we look back lord that we wouldn't be caught up in vials of water and mustard seeds and and prayer cloths lord Help us, Lord, to, to sink our teeth into what's real, and that is you. And, God, that you're not in a mustard seed necessarily or a cloth or a vial of water. Lord, you're in us. You live in us. And so, Lord, uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to guide us and to empower us and to encourage us and strengthen us, invigorate us. God, I pray that our greatest passion would be to do the work of God through the Holy Spirit in the redemption of souls. God, help us to be a true church. And God, I pray that you'd help me to be a true leader. God, I don't know how you authenticate me. I don't know what my special gift might be. But God, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen it, Lord, that you would manifest it more than you ever have. God, I know in order for that to happen, I've got to walk worthy of this vocation. And God, I've got to walk close to you. So, Lord, I pray that that would be the case. And Lord, not just me. Lord, just remind our people that it's not just about the pastor. It's about the people. God, I pray that we would all hold ourselves accountable before you. Lord, we love you, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a good night, live stream. Thank you all so much for tuning in.